Hello and welcome everyone to our 12th episode of our Partnership Ecosystems Improvement Series. Uh, today we will dive into the second part of partner enablement, motivation. Uh, we will explore the critical role of channel partner incentives, highlighting their significance, types, uh, along with key considerations for designing successful incentive programs uh, as they require careful consideration and alignment with business objectives. Mastery of this aspect of your channel ecosystem will significantly, sign significantly impact your ability to maximize your partner's potential, uh, help you reach higher engagement rates. Uh, we hope this discussion will provide you with insights you need to start building that relationships. So as always, we have Jill Esposito, who has worked with uh, channel partnership and alliances for nearly 25 years, worked with distributors, vendors, and partners, and brings a 360 degree view to the conversation on partner ecosystems. Carlo Breda, uh, he spent you know, over three decades in the channel, passionate about partnerships and how companies can optimize the power of their partner ecosystems. And I am the director of operations here at Gorilla. I worked with and managed channel sales and marketing programs for a variety of vendors um, and helped several build their channels from ground up. So let's jump right in, Jill and talk about you know how vendors you know can immediately um, begin to incentivize you know we've we've taught we've taken them to this point um now we need to incentivize these partners so what's the benefit uh first and foremost to the vendors for launching these incentive programs all right so hi aaron hi everybody and thank you for uh attending today and uh, thank you again for attending today for those of you who have uh, attended more than this one um so to start with the uh uh something i say every time about partnerships it's uh it's not like you just do one race and you win right it's an aggregate of the success your your successful partner initiative or partner ecosystem initiative is going to be dependent on an aggregate of uh, a ton of little things and uh, all of them complementing or adding to each other. And this is what, at the end of, uh, at the, end of the day, uh, is going to yield something that is successful. It's not that one thing you're doing. It's a number of things you're doing. And uh, partner motivation slash incentives is something that is part of that stack. Um, as I always say as well, um, a partner program and everything around it is not a, you know, you've, you've done a bunch of things and that's it it's done move on to the next partner move on to the next thing and, and all that no it's uh you have to keep you start the fire that's great but then you have to keep it going right and you have to fuel it through different things and all that incentivization is is one of them to uh maximize the potential of your partner to create more mind share which is again your one currency that you want uh, most and foremost now talking about the the benefits of uh uh you know putting in place incentives and higher level of motivation <coughs> it's uh the the most important thing is the end game which is to get more revenue right so right. it does increase sales it does increase um you know your pipeline and then sales it does increase your market share or your share of the wallet at certain customers and so on and so forth right it also improve improves on uh your your brand recognition uh, maybe um the awareness as well if you're not there um but do, do this type of thing it definitely increases the relationship you're going to have with your with your partner and what's important to me is that Every time you're going to launch a SPIF or an initiative or an incentive of any sort and all that, it gives you an opportunity to get back on top of their mind, right? That's what is important. If you do this intelligently and by intelligently, I don't mean that the people that don't do it are not intelligent. I just mean there is a way to promote those things. Uh, it's it's a, It gives you a window to be able to talk to their sales team. Um, mm -hmm. You just don't want to send to your vendor manager a, you know, a small PowerPoint presentation that says, hey, we have a new SPIF and it's X, Y, Z, and here's how it works. And here's the terms and condition and blah, 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 and hope that he's going to pass that on to everybody or she. 
uh, and that kind of stuff. No, that that's an opportunity for you every time you're going to have an idea of something you're going to deploy to make your partners more engaged and more excited about your stuff. You want to make sure that you present it to a wider audience as possible because it gives you a connection at this point. One more. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you, at that moment, at least you're going to be top of their mind, right? And that's good. Right. That's a little bit more mind share. So that, that that's and, always good. Yeah. Go and, ahead. In your, oh, I was just going to ask in your experience, you know, how much input do you get from the partners as you're putting together these incentive programs? Uh, well, well, uh, that that's a little bit later. But just like for everything else, when you create starting with your channel program and and all the different variables you have in your channel programs and all that it's it's a good thing to uh your your if you have an ecosystem of partners in place already it's a good thing to go and talk to uh some of your partners and say hey i'm thinking of doing x y and z what do you think right and mm -hmm. uh and probe a little further than that if you have a very good relationship with some of the partners you usually talk to to get some information as to what would be interesting for them to see from you the vendor um ask them about what was very successful from other vendors right you don't need right. to reinvent the wheel uh make them involve um talk to the sales management team or um the ceo depending on the size but uh definitely the sales leadership and tell them hey you know what has worked in the past that you'd like to see from other vendors and maybe we can do that or what would fit particularly well was your team what kind of incentive they're you know uh they want to know that and and that's um, uh, a function in the incentive design program uh that uh incentive program design that we have at gorilla that we uh we can talk about we have a structured approach to creating incentives and uh one point on which we insist uh, quite a bit is targeted rewards right Mm -hmm. um, or incentives, uh, whatever you want to call them, and make sure that they fit what the company, uh, they match what the company needs and, you know, um, everything that, that they may want at that point because, again, it may have worked in the past or it's something that is exciting to them more so than just saying, hey, we'll give you a $250 Amex gift card for this or for that. Uh, right. Although it would work pretty well, but uh, it's uh, it it's <clears throat> talk to your partner all the time before you do things, and particularly, and I'll touch about that when I'll be talking about compliance and fairness. Right. Uh, but particularly in the in the realm of compliance, um, everything around the legal aspect of things and all that, when you're gonna spiff or do any form of incentives. Um, you may talk to the sales reps, they may get excited about it and all that. Before you do all that, make sure you talk to, because if you excite your sales reps and then you say, hey, your management doesn't want to do that, sorry, they're going to be frustrated, right? So right. before you present right. something, make sure you talk to the leadership team at your partner. So it might be a single person. If it's a large partner, you're going to have to go through their legal and that kind of stuff and all that, but make sure you get permission in writing to be able to do that particular thing. You yeah. will find very often and, and more and more today. So in the past, like 20 years ago, it was like a piece of cake, right? You could create any incentives, go to any partner, everybody would embrace it. Nobody would care about what it is as long as it was more money coming into for them and that kind of stuff. <laughs> and then it started to get more and more refined, right? Where you had partners that starts to say, hold on a second. Uh, we only we already spiffed their sales rep, right? It's called a commission. <laughs> and uh, uh, why do we spiff them more? And why not starting mm -hmm. to spiff or incent the pre-sales people that are uh, actually, from a sales cycle perspective, more important to us than the actual salesperson, uh, and so on and so forth. And then we started to see some of the programs uh, we do at Gorilla uh, incent uh, the marketing, the channel marketing people, and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. So. And sometimes you have the company that says, no, we, we want to be fair with everybody. Everybody actually contribute to the success of you, the vendor here in this company, even the person that answers the phone. Uh, so the money goes to, you know, the rewards are going to go to the company. And then we will decide how we distribute it and that type of thing and all that. So right. every time you're going to design something, get ready for some pushback. And sometimes the pushback is going to be a big, no, no, we don't do any of that. 
Why? Well, because they want to have everybody on the same level playing field and they understand that a small vendor is not going to be capable of doing the same thing as a very large one. Mm -hmm. uh, number one thing. Number two thing, they don't want to start having uh, influencers being the spiffs or the incentives to start steering their sellers in a direction that might not be the direction the management wants, right? Right. Um, so, and sometimes they don't want, so in, in those cases, very often you'll hear, nope, sorry, don't do spiffs, sir. Don't do incentives, don't do X, don't do Y, at least not financial ones. You'll see there's a lot of other things you can do beside the financial stuff. Uh, right. Sometimes they're going to schedule it for you, right? You may want to do it at the end of a quarter to increase your your sale as a vendor in that particular for that particular product or service or whatever because you're a little short. They're going to say no. Sorry, we only allow X spiff concurrent spiff at the same time, right? Those three slots or that one slot or whatever is taken. Let's put you on a calendar for next quarter, next month, next year, something like this. And then you'll be able to do your spiff with us. And it may not coincide with what you want, may not coincide with your strategy. But that's the way it is, right? They're going to dictate whether or not you can do it and no. But on top of the good ideas you can get, this aspect uh, is extremely important. And you, know, you have to keep this in mind. And uh, you have to do your due diligence to talk to the management every time. Uh, to make sure that you're not going to run into a wall or just get a big flat no, you can do this here uh, out of that particular partner that you are targeting, right? Right. Um, so, and and at the end of the day, right, the benefit to the vendor is increased partner engagement, right? You're involving your partners; they're going to be engaged, and that's you know uh, again an additional benefit uh, for the vendors. And you, as a vendor, you may you may not have. Um, you know, I, I know some vendors that have teams dedicated to just doing this, right? Uh, they just do incentives day in, day out. That's all they do. And they create specific, so they're usually part of the channel marketing team, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but um, they're going to, based on the goals of the company at that moment, the goals of the vendor and what they want to promote over what or how far are they from their target and how can they accelerate this and all that? They're going to keep on creating stuff and stuff and stuff. Uh, usually, the team is is purely creative from a standpoint. They don't personally engage with uh, with the partners. So uh, this is related to the channel manager or the cams or that kind of stuff. And and these mm -hmm. people have to spread the word that this new thing is coming out, and this new incentive is uh, now available or will be available in a couple of weeks and start making meetings to present what it is to everybody, get a presentation ready, pitch it, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. Right. right. Um, what you really need to do is, uh, is uh, just like everything else um, for, for channels, you need to make sure that as a vendor, your partner are going to be engaged in this. So again, another good point you made, uh, Aaron, talking about the fact that um, it's important to talk to your partner before you launch anything. So they get excited, they get teased a little bit, or you know flat out uh, that it's not going to work because nobody gets any excitement out of your story and you know you're going to have to do something different, right? right. Uh, but it doesn't stop there. Just like what I said at the beginning, uh, that that's why so when we talk about uh designing incentive programs and the structure of design you have to have objectives obviously you know you don't just throw uh something out there hoping it's just going to generate more sales and all that you traditionally you got to be a little bit more specific mm -hmm. uh, but it can be that if you're a small vendor and you have only one product or one service and you want to promote it guess what it's going to be centered around this uh, no particular geos, you're not going to be uh, rejecting deals that are coming from, you know, someplace that you didn't think of uh, targeting at the beginning. If you got business, you're going to take it most likely. Right. Right. Uh, for the others, uh, it's it's important to have uh, to have something specific. Uh, usually I like I like specific targets better than wide open targets for everything that can feed out of it. Uh, but again, the, the, the two things are, are, are good, right? Depending on who you are as a vendor. What you want, though, uh, in any case, is to have a way to measure 
the efficiency of your uh, of your program, of your incentive program. Right, right. that specific incentive or that specific form of motivation that you put in place. And so you have to think this just like everything else we've said in the past 11, you know, I have a plan before you put something on the paper and you start promoting something. I have a plan uh, and your plan has to be demonstrable, you know, to your management when your spiff is going to be over or the incentive is going to close uh, and say, hey, we've invested, you know, X thousands of dollars in this. And we've netted at that, you know, so that they will be more uh, likely to approve the next one you're going to be doing and these type of things, right? But also have a plan to measure the partners, which one are engaged, which one are not engaged, and, and yep. that type of thing. So um, uh, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of sales here. Uh, through, uh, through some of the things we do at Gorilla, we have, uh, we have a concierge program uh, that reinforces uh, the channel team efforts of any vendor. And this, that could be on the sales front, but it's very often as well on the marketing front includes right. program like the ones we're talking about. So incentive programs and where for us, the beacon, what we keep our eyes on is that engagement level from the partners, right? And uh, making sure that every partner is aware of it, knows how they work, um, how long are they going to last? What are the conditions for being eligible for X, Y, and Z and that kind of stuff? And regularly come back to a set of partners that we agree with the vendor that we're going to tackle and take care of uh, to make sure that the adoption of that particular incentive and the engagement around this particular incentive is working, right? And is working at the highest level. So we do that. We understand not everybody is capable of doing this. Mm -hmm. Another point in time initiative. So it's very easy to slot a third party vendors like Gorilla to come in, grab the stuff and run with it and make sure the partners are buying it. And uh, and if there's things that need to be changed, report that because we keep all those metrics, all that information. And we ask all those questions. Wow. Yep. And, and that goes right Close along it. with the first mm -hmm. couple of uh, steps you outlined in, in designing these programs, right? You know, making sure the objectives are clear, uh, that it's it's transparent, it's simple, and that you're, yeah. it's measurable, right? So uh, you, you got a good point here. You mentioned something I didn't touch yet, transparency and simplicity. So transparency mm -hmm. is really important that uh, whoever are the stakeholders or the potential beneficiaries of a program, an incentive programs, understand very clearly the rules of engagement, the terms and conditions, and all those type of things because there's always discussion around this. So to give you an example, one of my uh, one of my favorite spiffs or uh, incentive um, that I've deployed dozens of times, I'm not going to say hundreds, but dozens of times for sure, is one that puts me as a vendor, that puts my, my sellers in front of potential customers, right? So in order to do that, we, uh, we put in place a SPIV that says to the sellers at the partners, right? To the salespeople at the mm -hmm. partners, say, there we go. Every time you're going to put my rep, one of my rep with you in front of a prospect for us, might be a customer for you already, but in front of a prospect for us, boom, you get a, a $200 gift card, right? And if this turns into an a valid opportunity registration, this will net you another $200, $250, you know, gift card. Mm -hmm. When you think of it, so to have a, a qualified, because at this point, that means you have a qualified sales lead. So in the terms and condition, it says that the approval of this, making sure that it's recognized as a valid lead, which is been qualified, right? So there's a budget, there's a need, there's an authority you're talking to a person that is either a heavy influencer or the decision maker right. and it's 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 uh, scripted in the timeline where they know by when they want to buy that stuff right uh, what it is that you're you're pitching the validation of this is not as not to be done by the rep at the partner but as to be done by the rep at the vendor so now the rep at the vendor says yep this is good this is really a solid opportunity and all that Pay this guy is two hundred and fifty dollars, right? So now you've spent, let's say, two fifty and two fifty, something like that. You've paid five hundred bucks mm -hmm. for a qualified, an absolutely qualified lead. 
that's much less expensive than if you go to a company and say, we're only going to pay you on, you know, deals, uh, or lead that right. generate deals and that kind of stuff, or potentially generate deals and that kind of stuff where you can pay upwards of a thousand dollars for one. So it's, uh, so you save money, not only you save money, but you only pay when the thing happens, right? You don't, yep. you don't pay ahead of time. And this, so there's a lot of, a lot of benefits, but there's also a lot of grayish areas here, right? And uh, it leads to just like any other grayish area in the in the channel space, it's going to lead to conflicts, and you don't want that. Mm -hmm. This is why, again, you want to present this very clearly, very transparently, and give scenario and say if X, Y, and Z happen, then yes, you get it. If A, B, and C happen, then you don't. Uh, here's why, you know. And and I usually do that when I present a. Um, a SPIV that has a little bit of complexity as to the qualifiers in it to make yeah. sure you, you're eligible for the reward or not, where I present scenarios of things that can happen and say, in this situation, you don't get it. Here's why. And if people come back later and say, well, you know, how what come is... I didn't get paid on this? Yeah. I send them back to the page seven of the PowerPoint of page three and say, remember this scenario? That's exactly what you're describing. Right. right? And you want to avoid that. So ahead of time, you want to make sure you've thought about as many cases as possible that can create a conflict and either solve them through uh, the way you scrape your T's and C's or even better, give example scenarios and show them that, right. Uh, of course, you want to stay as simple as possible. If it gets too complex, if you have to wait right. for the source to align before you can engage with the customer. And then if that day of the meeting was the sales rep, he wasn't wearing a green shirt, but instead a red shirt and all that. And then you don't get paid the same amount of money because red is not good. But whatever. I mean, do type of thing you want to avoid as much as possible. Uh, make it light so that people at a glance can understand very quickly what they need to do. People being the sales rep or whoever you're targeting, maybe the pre-sales engineers, maybe both. Uh, make sure you're, you know, uh, the more complex it is, the less they will participate. Um, right. And, yeah, you know, just like, uh, and they will forget, and move to another one. Um, so that that type of thing. Um, since we're in the design, we may as well continue, right? So we talked about yep. defining objectives and associating them with metrics that are clear and easy to understand. Uh, transparency, make sure you put the rules of engagement and how you play the game in front of everybody very clearly um before all that get the validation from their management that you can do it and get validation from usually the sales management and or the management of the team that you're targeting uh to help you with ideas and things that have worked in the past with other vendors uh they will share that information most of the time right it's not exactly uh secrets uh but it might be so don't push too hard um other things that are uh, important uh, is, uh, so we were talking about compliance and those type of things. So be very careful with that. For I'm going to give you an example that uh, everybody that has worked with me at Avnet because I was covering Canada is very aware of. Uh, I don't know if things have changed because I haven't touched that uh, region. But for example, if you're, if you're doing in the Canadian region, um, if you're trying to do incentives, Either completely exclude Quebec from it, or make sure your legal team is ready to create and your finance team is is ready to create an escrow account to provision the payouts, right? Because Quebec demands that all the potential payouts that you're going to have out of a SPIF are provisioned ahead of time in an escrow account with the government of Quebec, so that there's no risk of not paying the people that are eligible for the stuff. So you got to find the money. Right, that kind of stuff, yeah. and it's like it's a nightmare to manage and that kind of stuff. So usually, uh, so at Itachi, for example, when we were doing uh, incentives uh, for North America, we just excluded Quebec out of it, and that would piss off all the people in Quebec, uh, obviously. Mm -hmm. But yeah. we're like, sorry, it's too complicated from a legal standpoint to do something with uh, with incentives in uh, in this province. So just excluded it, but a lot of company do it, but you got to be aware of the local rules and, and those type of things when, when you yeah. do incentives, right? So if your company has any reach in different geos of the world, 
make sure you're very, very aware of that because the fines you're going to get and uh, and the headaches and all that are not worth it. So um, it, it, it's important. And the last thing that for me is, is usually, um, well, not the last thing, the one before last that is really important is the payouts, right? So in your terms and conditions, you are clearly explain how the payouts uh, is working, right? And so it might be quarterly, it might be monthly, it might be depending on the length of your program and do type of thing. Make sure when you say you're gonna pay at 15 days after the end of each month, you pay at 15 days after the end of each month, right? If you're not confident with that, then, you know, make it delay the payment, but it has to be done in the T's and C's. It has to be clearly expressed here. It seems obvious right. for everybody, but I've seen so many horror stories about this that, and and when you get a rep that is upset with you, good luck having this one rep engaged and pushing your product after that, right? So yeah. make make sure alongside with the uh, transparency and the, the, the clear presentation of the T's and C's that you also are timely when it comes to payments and recognition and blah, blah, blah. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and the last one, just like the first thing I opened, right? In in the design of the things, it's uh, it's always the same thing. You do not uh, launch something and then look at it and see how it works and are happy or not happy with it. You can constantly improve on those things. You can come back every month and say, hey, we're tweaking this program to add this or to remove that or, you know, or to change this particular thing and... You have things associated for, you know, it has to be done within the next three months. And then people realize that your sales cycle is not exactly three months, for example, and this type of thing. Right. Uh, then make it six months, right? Who cares? Yeah. You're only going to pay, do things when they happen anyway. So that's the beauty of channels. You don't have to, you have to fund very little money besides the team you're, you have as a vendor to manage that, right? But yeah. from everything that is motivational to the partners and all that, you're not going to pay ahead of time, right? Uh, yeah. you're going to pay when they deliver so uh but be consistent uh in in you know don't don't ask things that are completely unrealistic or or you know people are going to walk away from your stuff or not just pay attention to it and yeah. then it digs your changes next time you're going to do another one even if the other one is is stellar and very well prepared and all that they're still going to remember the previous one that was a total failure and your chances of getting any mind share out of this is going to be seriously limited. So uh, yep. be careful with that. Well, right? and, and what you're talking about right now kind of ties in. Chris posted a question. Um, how often should a vendor meet with partners to maintain motivation? And this I think, ties into that uh, continuous uh, evaluation, right? Um, so I don't know if there's a specific time frame uh, of how often, but maybe as you, as you adjust and, and change it or before you adjust and change it. There's, uh, I mean, really, there's, it, it's, uh, it, it depends uh, on so many other factors, right? I mean, it's a very yeah. good question. Uh, my answer is going to be a little, you know, stupid, but it's, it's going to be as often as possible. Um, because here's the thing with Mindshare that I, uh, that we also tell people all the time. It's like every time they're going to give you an hour and a half or going to lunch with them. It's an hour and a half they're not going to spend with someone else right true and just to remind everybody your competition at your partners is everybody else that is on the line card not just the one that do the same product as you do everybody mm -hmm. right because every hour that you're selling keyboards and and uh there's another logo that sells servers um Sorry, every hour that they spend with the guy on the servers is hours they're not going to spend with you, right? Uh, right. Talking about your product or looking into your solutions and blah, 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 that kind of stuff. So incentives, um, uh, tying incentives into, you know, engagement um, from a channel management or or sales, man or, or sales team at the vendor with the sales team and the pre-sales team of the partner, which are your, your, let's face it, your two main stakeholders, right? In this order. Um, you, every time you're gonna put something new, such as that can be of interest to them, such as an incentive, a spiff, 
a promotion, something like this. That gives you an opportunity to pick up the phone and say, hey, Joe, can you bring your sales team and we're going to do a lunch and learn or we're going to do a, you know, we're going to go to the bar and we're going to spend like a good two, three hours together. Talk, and, and within that amount of time, you're going to present your stuff, but you're going to have a captured audience. And, and, and again, they're with you during that time, not with someone else. So it right. is number one benefit. Number two benefit, you're going to be able to engage with all these gals and guys here at the bar or restaurant or event or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, spend some time with them if you can do that, right? If it's not in person, then, you know, set up a webinar and say, hey, you know, I'm, um, can you bring your whole team and that kind of stuff? Yeah, well, the whole team is going to be there or some part of the team is going to be there. During that time, they're going to have your name or the name of your company top of mind not anybody else and that kind of stuff. So you can pass your message about your incentive, but if there's any other message that you need to convey at that time or a question you need to ask or try to understand things and all that, that's a good moment to do that as well, right? Yep. Um, and uh, so again, my answer to how often should you engage in all that, it's, it's, you know, providing you're not triggering the red line of this guy is really, or this person is really too sticky or, you know, too much harassment here from this vendor or that kind of stuff. You don't want to get to that point, but so you want to find excuses to why you reach out to them and, and that kind of stuff. You always want to have like a reason why you reach out to them, not just, uh, hey, Aaron, I'm just calling you because, well, frankly, you guys are doing shit and uh, I would love it if you would be a little bit more engaged with me. Not an ideal approach uh, in my book, no. at least. Uh, depending on the relationship you have with Joe, right? But uh, right. or with Aaron. But if you have a great relationship and they're not doing stuff and you know that you expect them to do, then yes, I mean uh, absolutely. If you have just a business relationship and all that, bring something that you uh, that actually is your your wedge into a deeper discussion about other things. Probably when you're going to do that, just don't go point blank with them and say, you know, and certainly do not go point blank with salespeople at the end of a quarter. Uh, the, the vendor manager that are doing this, uh, the channel manager that are doing this usually are met with uh, uh, a lot of dislike uh, coming just at the end, showing up just at the end of the quarter to say, hey, what do you got for me? Mm -hmm. it's, it's partners hit that. Partner management hit that. Uh, partner CEOs despise this with a passion because you're starting to, you know, uh, to take on their time to dilute their efforts at the end of the quarter, which is the worst time for you to do that, right? right. And and that usually translates into poor channel management when you go to a partner at the end of the quarter. Good channel managers don't need to go to their partners at the end of the quarter. They already know what they're going to get. Yep. Yeah, and, absolutely. And they don't need to do that. But again, you know, if if you need to have that discussion, then fine, have that discussion. Just don't make it a habit. Uh, if if you need to go, if you need to close uh, because you're a little bit short of your numbers and, you know, just a few deals are going to make a difference for you and all that, go to the one that really like you and ask for help. You know, just tell them, hey, I'm in a pinch here. Can you help me? Right. Can you move that deal like two weeks earlier or? A week earlier or something like this, right? right? I mean, we we do that in channel management all the time. Uh, and salespeople do that with their customers when they have good relationships all the time. But emphasis on good relationships to uh, yeah. do that. But again, use that. Uh, use that to reinvigorate the uh, the level of engagement, uh, your position in their stack of things they have to think of. So again, every time you're going to spend time with them, boom, you're going to be on top of the stack. Maybe not for long, yep. but during the time you're going to be presenting and all that, they'll remember how to spell your name, uh, which is a good thing. Not everybody's a Dell or an Oracle or a Microsoft, right? Um, so for the smaller vendors, it's really important to do those type of things. And again, the way you pitch it, if you're in channel management, the way you pitch it to your CEO and this and that, it's like it's only money you provision. It's not money you spend. It's money you provision in case of success. And then if there is success, yeah, of course, you're going to pay that money. But it's a good thing at this point, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because you're going to get a very positive ROI out of this. Um, yep. 
and every time it gives you an opportunity to talk to the partners and engage with them yep. and blah 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 that kind of stuff increase your mind share tyler yep. had a couple uh nice comments uh he had always wondered why quebec was left out of spiff programs and now understands and, yep. uh, That's advises, of advises vendors not to send pizza and um, so they he would uh wallpaper the warehouse with pizza boxes vendors would bring <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that, great tyler that is, you know those are nice things to do every now and then bring a coffee cart send pizzas that kind of stuff and all that end of quarters and all that try to not only target the reps when you do those type of things right i mean that's that's by default you know we give reps commissions um uh i mean like Partner management gives rep commission. That's how they get paid, right? Um, and on top of that, 90% of the fifths are targeted at the reps. Does it make sense? Absolutely. Uh, is it a solid uh, uh, strategy? Yeah, I think so, right? Can you do better than that? Yes, you can. You know, try to... There's a lot of other people uh, that uh, work at a partner that can be instrumental to you. The marketing teams Absolutely. are one of them. Right. Yeah. I, what do you thought of that? Uh, 15 years ago, we weren't considering any incentives for pre-sales engineers. Right now, we realize that. Let's look at it frankly. Most of the sales are done by the sales engineers. Right. The rep opens yeah. the door and get the PO. Everything in between is usually door, done by sales engineer. If yeah. we're if we're talking about technical solutions, uh, so anything hardware, software, or those type of things. Absolutely. Um, but try to think about the other people and it, it goes a long way, especially with small partners. It doesn't cost too, too much money and it goes a long way with the CEO of the company when he sees that you're having these little touches and, and that type of thing, right? With their work, other working bees. Uh, so that that's important. Yeah. Any other questions? No, I, I think, you know, we've talked about, you know, benefits, you know, why it's important, some benefits and, and some things that go into designing these programs. Uh, but, you know, and you've mentioned some financial incentives, uh, a couple of them, but uh, but I think we can dig into you know, kind of the, uh, some other types of incentives, uh, additional financial yeah. incentives, non-financial and and other um, incentives that you've seen really successful. Yeah, uh, and, and the financial past. incentives, not everything is a spiff, right? Not everything right. is like, if you sell this, you get an extra that. Uh, if you get me in front of a customer, you get a 250 uh, Amex gift card or Visa gift card. And then if you turn it into an opportunity registration, validate it, blah, 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 uh, you get an extra one and that kind of stuff. There's there's other things that, may, that usually appeal more to uh, the management of the company. Uh, Every big company usually does that. Every distributor does that. But you as a vendor may not be using a, uh, maybe smaller and not be using a distributor. Most likely you won't uh, before a mm -hmm. while. But talking about volume discounts or back-end rebates, uh, yeah. tier discount, uh, specific yeah. product. Uh, uh, specific, if you have like a line card and you want to push this new product you just launched more than the rest, uh, things associated to that particular uh, line of product, right? With yeah, multipliers or other stuff, right? Yeah, Tyler just MDF, made a comment about that. So MDF and MDF multipliers, right? Right. Uh, we're we're you know if you you can go to their marketing teams and say, hey, if you guys engage in two X you know campaigns that are going to net at a minimum X leads uh, for this particular line of services or line of product or line of software or whatever that we're doing, you'll get a one time 1.5 time mdf out of them instead of your regular one right or 2x or whatever that that type mm -hmm. of thing. It, it's money that's going to be reinvested for you anyway uh so it's uh it stays in the house uh that's the way i like to say it uh and you can decide who you do it with right it, it doesn't have when you launch a spiff program it doesn't have to be for all your partners so if we go back sure. to the design that we talked about we talked about targeted rewards uh that can go to targeted programs and you can say i'm only going to take these because they're already fairly well engaged and that kind of stuff and all that i don't want to waste money or time uh with the others but let's try a little something with the other see if this tick see if they yeah. do something and then we can bring them on to like other incentives that we do that are more rewarding or more time consuming for us blah 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 
that kind of stuff. Yeah. But those are, you know, MDF, like multipliers on MDF is a good thing. Uh, of course, all your kind of sales incentive programs. And that can have the form of what we described with having gift cards or, you know, monetary fund, uh, uh, gift cards for doing specific actions or when they're validated. Um, mm -hmm. and so on, of course, but it can also be a competition between your partners or a competition between reps at the same partners or between reps throughout all your partners. And at the end of the year, whoever wins, wins a car whatever I've, I've seen all of that uh so be very careful with all that kind of stem from a tax management and uh, also when you give financial rewards you got to make sure that you specify that everything related to taxes and all that is uh, uh the onus is on the beneficiary not on your company that has to manage this and all that but this has to be scripted in the t's and c's when you do that right it's important right um what else so yeah margins um any kind of margins any kind of yeah, co additional margin you know, sellers you know, uh, uh i mean if you google financial incentives you're going to get like three pages of stuff so it's um uh, i mean we'll 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 publish a uh, uh a little document uh right. like we do every time uh that will summarize this discussion and uh structure it uh from uh you know the why do we do this and what are the benefits and um how do we structure an incentive program what are the different type of incentives we can leverage from the financial one non-financial ones blah 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 that kind of stuff so that if you in the audience uh need to build something and then bring it to your management to pitch it you will have hopefully a good baseline to uh structure it properly pitch it properly and so on and so forth so and i have a few ideas to what you can do any other question that I need to answer at this point, um, Aaron? Or nope? Uh, no, yeah, we're we're caught up on. And I, I agree on on bring shawarma. I I I it's better than pizza. <laughs> way more healthy. Um, probably a little more difficult to find a good one, but um, it's uh, I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, so no, the financial incentives, right? We're talking about so it can be you know giving the partner access to some things that other partners don't have access to it can be co-marketing and sales support and do type of thing it can be it can be a ton of things right um but again you know all designed around right increasing sales and market share brand, brand alignment promotion of the partner logo on your website yep. uh it can, awards of any sort that they can then you know i have a claim of fame of um it, it can be it can be a tough thing recognition and awards uh you can have a reward program as well well it says it's it's in the non-financial but it is kind of financial right where you award points for uh doing xyz and a number of things and they get they accumulate points and then you have your web store of your company where they can buy more of your t-shirts with your crappy logo or your red logo depending or you know mugs and stuff like this I, my right. advice and why I say crappy logo and all that is like don't make it too centric on you try to make it centric on what they like uh so try if you if you do a reward thing try to make put things for them to get that are something they actually want to get not something that's going to end up in a closet uh or in a box in the garage or something like this um yeah and uh and then you have you know trips and travels and uh gift cards of uh, they're not financial gift cards well they are uh they can be other things like uh so charity is something that comes very often right or you can say hey if you guys do x y and z or if you're in the top three partners this year or that kind of stuff we will contribute to your charity of choice and to an equal amount that what you're doing or that kind of stuff and all that this is if there's one to be checking for legal and compliance and all that it's particularly this one uh be very careful with that uh but it can be you know it can be nominating them for a partner council it can be you know if you guys achieve x y and z you'll be able to get to the partner council the goal here is not to to find out which one is the best one it's to do a lot of them right and having a machine that constantly enables you to get back on the 
on, on the top tier of their mind, right? I'm not going to say top of mind because you can't, if you're a little vendor, you can't compete with, again, a Microsoft, a Google, an IBM and, and whatnot uh, from, my, from a mindshare perspective, but keeps you up there. And, and this is an opportunity to do that. That's why this is, this is, you started your fire. It's working fine at the beginning. You onboarded your partner properly. They like what you're selling. They like the money they can make out of your solutions, right? Keep adding a few logs to that fire every now and then, right? So it's, it's still bright and warm rather than, you know, past the honeymoon, nothing else happens. Guess what? Uh, so that, that's, yeah. that's well, it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's still lead generation, referral support, um, you know, maybe some new products that you give some partners early access to if they, uh, you know, a, a, as another incentive, right? Maybe they have a complimentary vendor that you're trying to break in with and, and you offer some incentives around that. Um, so, yeah, so that's another area that is also interesting from a vendor perspective is to have mm -hmm. multiple vendors uh working on a on a single incentives or a single set of incentive that are um so as soon as you're going to tap your incentive or, or make your incentive tap into multiple buckets that the condition for winning something is going to be more complicated because now you're going to have to promote x and y rather than just x uh you got to be just a little bit more thorough when doing this um sales people usually don't like it as much. Uh, management love it. Uh, CEOs love it because suddenly instead of selling one thing, you know, you're going to be selling two of them or three of them or whatnot. So right. it has to be carefully crafted. Uh, now, instead of being one team that is going to be working out of a particular incentive with intricate knowledge of the product and their legal environment and this and that, they're going to have to deal with one other vendor or maybe two other vendors, let's say just mm -hmm. one other vendor, right? So that requires a good level of engagement with that other vendor, not just the people that worked on the integration together, but you're going to have to engage with their marketing team. You're going to have to engage with their legal team. Uh, so vendor to vendor, uh, you're going to have to engage with their channel team and that kind of stuff and start designing. So now you're going to have to work on a strategy uh, with them on how you're going to promote that spiff. Are you going to design that spiff? What are the joint uh, T's and C's are going to be? And sometimes I've I've seen uh, I've seen those promotions coming going out with two different sets of T's and C's. You're already edging in an area that is not comfortable with most partners when you start having two sets of legal documents associated to something. Mm -hmm. uh, um, because some, and you have to make sure that some things are not mutually exclusive, you know, like from each other and, and it's, it, it's more complex to do. Uh, does it work? Yes. Uh, especially if the two vendors put efforts they are uh, behind for promoting, uh, that new joint solution, for example, mm -hmm. right. Uh, when you do that, um, I've done this with, uh, quite a fair amount of vendor that were the same size as we were when I did them. And it's uh, just just be aware that from a uh, time perspective, it takes much longer uh, because certainly you have to rely on other people from a company on which you have no control, um, and therefore preparation in that aspect needs more time, uh, a lot more time sometimes, right? Because they may not be as excited about doing this as you are. Uh, so just from a planning perspective, you know, if traditionally you launch a spiff in like one month, like just about a quarter or two for launching a joint spiff, right? Because mm -hmm. your Markham's going to have to approve it. Your Markham's going to have to approve it. They're legal. You're legal. They're going to exchange stuff like left, right, center, you know, redlining the stuff because in, in behind you also have to have a uh, bounding document between the two companies to say who's going to pay for this, who's going to handle this in case of this scenario, who's going to do what and and so on and so forth right yep. so that's just it yeah and some other companies so when you uh i've had example also of doing uh, joint ip things uh with larger companies it's easier if you're a small vendor and you're dealing with a larger vendor usually when you do that because the larger vendor will usually take you know the lead and take care of everything 
right? So there's still going to yeah. be some engagement with your legal team and all that, but your efforts in that domain is going to be uh, less demanding. So I've done this with IBM a couple of times uh, with the John IP team at IBM's, and from the get-go, they tell us if we ever reach, uh, you know, an agreement where we want to co-promote something because part of your solution is in it and part of our solution is in it, we'll take care of everything, right? So that's uh, with large vendors, it's uh, usually the case because they don't want to be bugged by your inefficiencies. They're used by it, but to doing this and all that. So they'll agree with a few things with you and then they run with it and um, and they'll tell you what to do usually. So it's, uh, it's yeah, good. but well, and, and Tyler brought up a good point of the partner to partner uh, kind of uh, the P2P ecosystems you know, as if you're doing those, those joint solutions, um, you can kind of mm -hmm. broker it, uh, that way as, as well, which is, has been a very, you know, we've done a couple of those projects and they're always really, really interesting, um, to match those partners together with, with complementary or, or, uh, well, that, that, products. Yeah. that's something really good, right? Uh, that is, I, I completely agree with that. Um, any yeah. idea that can, you know, create a canvas of opportunity and all that, even if they might not be directly benefiting to you, it's going to be appreciated by the partner. It's going to give you points. You as mm -hmm. a an example that I use all the time. Uh, and we, um, uh, we did this, um, at Abnet, uh, we did this as a reward, you know, for some partners was to say, you know, we do like hundreds of lead gen campaigns every year, right? For the, right. So, for the, for different vendors and that kind of stuff. And we talk to our partners that are tied to that vendor without realizing always that funnel vision that they also sell a lot of other things that we're not interested in, right? Uh, so me, for example, I work for Itachi, I sell storage. Uh, for Itachi Ventura, it used to be Itachi data systems, but selling storage, right? And I got leads to feed my partners and I got a bunch of leads that arrive, a hundred leads. And out of the hundred leads, I have 30 that are like on target, right? They talk about storage, they need something and all that. What most everyone does is take those 30 leads and distribute them, right? To their partner mm -hmm. based on, you know, if it's already a radio customer of them, we know that information. That yeah. comes right Geography, what do you do with yeah. the 70 other leads nothing most of the people do nothing with them it's like no i mean i'm like i'm, I'm i only want to sell storage right this is for networking this is for cyber security this is for keyboards and mice and all that your partners that are selling your stuff for you the vendor itachi right um is also selling keyboard is also selling cyber security is also selling other stuff and all that why not give them those leads yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah. That gives you it, so many points when you do that. So as a vendor, you have your lead sources and you're you're generating a mm -hmm. ton of things and you're gonna see a bunch of things that are like completely irrelevant with what it is that you're doing. Yes, agreed. It might not be irrelevant to your partners though. It might be absolutely. very relevant to your partners. Yes, it's not gonna net you direct revenue, but I mean it, it feels sure. good for the, yeah. the the partner sellers and and the partner as a whole to say well this particular vendor even when they have stuff that is not relevant to them they still pass it on to us absolutely right? and this i mean great. you're Think staying there with your, your mind share uh exactly you know, the, yeah so i am the prize and the prize here is is always that mind share right the yeah. more time and they're going to spend thinking of you pitching you promoting you will translate sooner or later into more revenue for you. So mm -hmm. that's it. And a reason to reach out, right? Which we talked about earlier. So exactly. You got a, you know, Gives a you reason another to call your partner. Yeah. Hey, Bob, you know, I got this. They have a huge program and all that. Um, they're not buying any storage, but they're going to buy 10 racks of servers and networking and that kind of stuff. I thought maybe you wanted to be aware of that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You have the info. Yeah. I'll send it to you. Wow. Thank you. It's great. So good points. Yeah. All right. Um, we got about anything five else? Any, any other question? Um, you know, oh, what is it? 
I'm, I do have one. So, um, yeah, good point, Tyler. Uh, you know, we've you've seen a lot how incentive has changed over the years, and it'd be great to take the last couple of minutes and just talk about anything maybe you see on the horizon of how incentives may evolve over the next uh, the next couple of years. That's a that's a trick question. Um, uh, that that's a trick question because I haven't thought of that. Um, and the reason why I haven't I haven't been thinking of that is because the levers. So some things evolve in 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 everything, right? And channel is yeah. certainly not, not um, alien to that. Uh, there's been a lot of changes in the channel over the past thirty years, and uh, some things don't. Uh, mm -hmm. And what motivates people, especially salespeople, have not vastly evolved in the past. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. and, and, but here's where we make a mistake is that the evolution of the sales role is something that has happened and is still happening where you had your typical seller that was thinking of the next month's, you know, closing and then next quarter and that kind of stuff, this is evolving. And now they are thinking more long term on top of the short term because they still have those you know targets and buckets to fill by the end of the month or the end of the quarter or both. right um but now they're also having an approach to their business that is more savvy than what it used to be where they think more about the partnership more about the long-term stuff and all that so my answer to your question, my early answer to your question, because honestly, I haven't taken any time to think about the evolution of incentives, uh, is to say, you know, anything that can help this new generation of more savvy sellers uh, with their customers or their territory or, you know, uh, and we were talking about the non-financial incentives, right? Giving them access to data, giving them access to insights and stuff and all that that type of thing, that might be something worth looking at, right? Not at the point of sale, just I pay you when I get, you know, a deal, but at the point of value. And there's some element of value in what a vendor has that can tremendously benefit individual sellers or sell teams at sales teams at, at partners uh, that sometimes can be more valuable than just that $250 gift card, right? Sure. Um, yeah. so, so that, that's the route I would go with. Uh, but again, trick question. Thank you, Aaron. I hadn't thought about yep. it. So, no, uh, yeah. little curveball in there. Uh, yeah. World series time. So I gotta, gotta get one out there. All right. Well, Any other I, question? um, no, that's it. No, We're uh, coming up to the end. Yeah, okay. yeah, I yeah. think this has been a uh, a great discussion today. You know, I I do want to thank everybody for joining us um, and you know participating. I had some great comments, uh, so it was a really interesting topic. Great discussion. Um, as always, this uh, recording will be available on our website at gorillaict.com under our events tab, as well as on our YouTube channel. So connect uh, with us, follow us on LinkedIn as well. You'll get all the updates uh, as to our next webinar in November. Uh, we move our discussion to the sales team, look at strategies for building a positive relationship uh, between direct and indirect sales. So uh, thank you. That one oh, it's gonna be great. Yeah. So, all right. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everybody. Thank you.